This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Good evening and welcome. My name is Nigella Hilgarth and I'm the Executive Director here at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. And welcome to the latest in the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science series. And it's a great pleasure for me this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lisa Levin. Dr. Lisa Levin is a distinguished professor here at Scripps and she's also the Director for the Center of Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. And before moving to Scripps in 1992, she was associate professor in the Department of Marine Science and Atmospheric Sciences at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. She's a marine ecologist and she studies benthic ecosystems both in deep water and in shallow water. Um, she's worked in a very broad range of taxa from microbes and microalgae to invertebrates and fish. And tonight, well, she's really going to focus on the deep ocean that, as she says herself, covers over half the planet, and most of it is much less well known than the surface of the moon. She's participated in over 30 oceanographic expeditions around the world, and she served as chief scientist in 12 of those. And she's the author or co-author of 160 scientific publications, and really a really distinguished speaker to be speaking about deep ocean tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Levin. Thank you everybody for coming out on this cold and rainy night. Um, I'd like to start by dedicating this talk to Jeff Graham. Uh, as you heard, he was the founder of the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture Series, and I think it was a great vision he had, and I think you'll all agree it's been a very successful series. Um, Jeff left us far too early, um, but he did leave us with a tremendous amount of knowledge about the physiology and evolution of, of marine vertebrates, um, in sh uh, both sh sharks and tunas, also air-breathing fish, sea snakes, and a whole host of other organisms. So. My, uh, well, let, let, me, let me start by saying that the last time I was here in a perspectives lecture was about four years ago. And at that time, I talked about the un unusual environments and organisms in the deep sea that I study. And since that time, over the last few years, I've come to realize that it's important not only to convey the fascination of these environments, but also to reveal the expanding importance of the deep ocean to um, human well-being and to the well-being of the planet. And also, I believe it's important to talk about the challenges that deep sea ecosystems face from growing extractive industries and from climate change. And so that's what I'll be doing tonight. My presentation will have three main parts. I'll be talking um, about biodiversity at risk. And first, I'd like to tell you about what it is that is, in fact, at risk, how our understanding of the deep sea has changed in recent years, and what we know now about the services and functions it provides. Uh, and then I'll talk about the the risks we face from the expanding human footprint. And I'll be discussing re resource extraction, waste disposal, and climate change. And then I'll close the talk by trying to give some ideas about what types of action we can um, take to help preserve uh, the deep sea and make their functions available for the future generations. All right, so I'd like to start by just talking about the deep sea in general. Um, as Nigella said, it is the largest habitat on Earth. This pie diagram illustrates the vast area of the deep sea. In fact, it illustrates the whole surface of the planet with about 29% of the planet above sea level and the rest in the ocean. 
Um, and over two thirds of the planet, as you can see, is deeper than 1,000 meters. And in fact, the average water depth in the ocean is 3,800 meters, or 12,467 feet. So the, deep, the ocean is, in fact, very deep. We've seen very little of it. Less than 5% of the seafloor has been visited. And as a result, most of the species that live in the deep ocean remain undescribed. The study of deep sea biology began uh, about 150 years ago, around 1860, when scientists first realized that there was life in the deep sea, that it was not, in fact, a dark, azoic environment. And for the next 100 years, there were a great many different national expeditions that explored deep waters of the world from surface ships. And the picture of the deep sea that emerged from these expeditions was one, the one you see here, of a very dark, cold, muddy, homogeneous environment in which food was quite limiting for the organisms. We thought this was an essentially a stable, unchanging environment year after year. And it was, in fact, depicted this way as being flat and featureless and homogeneous um, in textbooks. So here's a typical picture of the deep sea, what you might have seen appear 30, 40, 50 years ago. However, over the last four decades, our understanding of the deep sea has evolved tremendously, due in large part to new acoustic technologies, which have allowed us to map in detail the topography of the seabed, with multi-beam sonar, and also to map features such as the bubbles emerging from the sea floor. This is an acoustic diagram of a methane sea. Um, and from this imagery, um, well, I should say, this imagery has been aided by human visitation in submarines and by uh, remotely operated vehicles that have created pictures and images by camera sleds. And now we have autonomous vehicles that can um, leave the ship untethered and take pictures of the seafloor. Um, so we've been gathering a tremendous amount of images, and this exploration has revealed um, that our continental margins are in fact no, not homogeneous, but very heterogeneous. Um, it's shown us that they're covered with hundreds of deep water canyons. Many of these support lush coral gardens, such as the one you see here. We've discovered that there are deep sea coral reefs um, far away from sunlight, there are reef building corals that thrive in cold water. Um, and as those corals die, their skeletons grow uh, or, or collapse and form mounds that may extend many um, hundreds of meters or kilometers across the deep sea floor. Here's an image of one right here. And they really look like uh, very lush coral gardens as well. We've discovered that the seafloor is covered with seamounts. There are at least 14,000 mapped seamounts. These are underwater volcanoes, um, often with dense fish aggregations and um, sponges and corals growing on them. And we've discovered that there are often reefs made entirely of sponges on the deep sea floor that provide an important habitat that I'll talk about. Another major discovery in the last 35 years has been that of ecosystems that thrive in the absence of sunlight. These include hydrothermal vents that were discovered in 1975, methane seeps, um, and these environments host animals that rely not on photosynthesis and sunlight for food, but they rely on chemosynthesis and symbiotic bacteria. We've also discovered that whale falls and wood falls support very similar kinds of chemosynthetic communities. So the picture that emerges is one of tremendous habitat heterogeneity in the seafloor. And um, all of these different kinds of habitats and ecosystems host very unusual organisms with amazing adaptations. And I'd like to show you just a few of my favorite from some of the kinds of environments that I've worked in. This is a terabellid polychaete that lives in extremely low oxygen zones. These are naturally low oxygen waters on our continental margins. And this um, polychaete has a branchial tree, essentially an external lung that's almost as big as the worm itself that with its enhanced surface area allows it to breathe. Another interesting adaptation is this alvanelid polychaete, which is wearing a, coat, a fur coat of bacteria. 
those bacteria detoxify the sulfide in the water at the hydrothermal vents where this worm lives. One of my very favorite is this nondescript oligochete worm shown here. Um, it lives in a basin off Peru, also with very low oxygen, um, but it has no mouth, no gut or anus, no digestive system at all. What it does have is a whole ecosystem living right under its skin, six different kinds of microbes that do things as varied as fix carbon to feed the worm and remove the worm's waste and allow it to breathe under very low oxygen conditions. So it essentially has an internal bacterial support system. Another interesting example um, it, are the bone-eating worms, Ocidax. Uh, these worms colonize dead whale bones on the seafloor, and they burrow into them, and they develop a root system that houses symbiotic bacteria, and those bacteria are able to degrade the collagen in the whale bone and feed the worm. So these are, you notice they're all, they're all worms here. I like to work on worms. Um, but, uh, but they're just uh, the tip of the iceberg of these incredible adaptations that we find down in the deep sea. At methane seeps, which are places where methane is squeezed out from the Earth's interior, we find some of the most toxic environments on Earth. The sediments are full of sulfide, which is toxic to most animals. Um, and what's also interesting about these environments is that they're the sediments here are colonized by this consortium of bacteria and archaea. These are two kinds of microbes that live together. They eat the methane, and in the process, they precipitate rock. They make carbonate as part of the byproduct of their activities, and so they build huge mounds on the continental margins where methane comes out. There's um, very few animals that can tolerate all the sulfide in these environments. Sulfide is a byproduct of their activity. But there's a group of small, nondescript worms, the Dorvillaid polychaetes. Um, each of these eats a different kind of microbe in these sediments. Um, and uh, they are capable also of eating the rocks, essentially, that are the bacteria in these rocks. And um, what's happened is these worms have radiated. They, there are so few animals that can tolerate those conditions that these worms have radiated to fill all the different niches in the methane seep ecosystem out here. And these sites are off California and Oregon at about five or 800 meters of water. Um, perhaps the most charismatic, charismatic of the critters at methane seeps are these dancing yeti crabs. I'll show you a movie if I can make this. These crabs uh, have a continuous swaying motion, which helps provide sulfide and removes waste for the fur-like symbiotic bacteria that lives on their claws. And these are the bacteria that give them their name, the Yeti crab. You can see they're, they're constantly in motion. And they're, they're a wonderful example of the strange creatures that can live down in the deep sea. Um, and in fact, Yetis have fascinated people. and, and um, inspired a series of pictures by artist Lily Simonson. I don't, Lily, are you in the audience? Wave your hands. There she is. This is her artwork. Um, and uh, I've been inspired by her pictures. She has a way of making them appear extremely exotic and lovable. <laughs> well, so these are just a few examples of some of the strange adaptations we find in the deep sea. Um, why should we care about these? Are they just simply odd curiosities? Or is there something important down there that we should really care about or that we, should, that we rely on? And what I'd like to do with the rest of this talk is tell you how uh, the deep sea has become an increasingly important source of food, of energy resources, and potentially could be a source of minerals. Um, all of these necessary to support the growing world population and its technology. I'd also, um, and, and we call these provisioning services. You can see I've listed also that there are potentially pharmaceuticals and industrial agents down there that we might be using. Um, the deep sea also provides important support functions in the form of habitat provision. Uh, and these habitats provide substrate, places where animals can attach, they provide nursery grounds and refugia for animals from predators, and they provide food support for life in the deep sea. 
here, these pictures show you a few examples. Um, uh, this is a picture of an Alaskan sponge, a uh, goblet sponge that's housing a juvenile rockfish. We think sponges are important nursery grounds for small fishes in the deep sea. Corals always support a wealth of organisms. You can see these Gorgonian corals with different invertebrates living on them. And one of the newest discoveries is the fact that methane seeps, those sites with methane bubbling out, um, actually serve as shark and ray nurseries. These are shark capsules and ray capsules. This, this methane seeps off Chile. This one's in the Mediterranean Ocean. We're just discovering that these animals um, are using them as brooding grounds for their young. I think it's also important that we begin to think about biodiversity as a service worthy of preservation in the deep sea. The many habitats and species in the deep sea host a wealth of genetic diversity, and it's in fact these genes that confer the potential um, for the adaptation to changing environments. And as I'll show you uh, later in this presentation, the deep sea environments are in <coughs> fact changing at this time. Um, some of these genes can be uh, valuable in a variety of different ways. For example, perhaps the most famous of the deep sea genes um, are from the bacteria that uh, occur at hot vents um, that have provided the basis of PCR and in fact enabled the molecular revolution. We have some genes that provide the the code for enzymes that allow us to wash detergent, to create detergents that break down lipids in cold water. We have some genes that confer metabolites that have turned out to prov provide, um, to function as antibiotics, as anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory agents, or even as anti-fouling agents for uses in boat paint. And we're beginning to look at other uses of deep sea organisms, for example, um, Bamboo corals are now being used for bone grafts in the medical profession. So these are just a few of the examples of some of the different kinds of provisioning services that we can obtain from the deep sea. The deep sea also provides what we call regulating services um, that play a key role in the planet's carbon and nitrogen cycles. The biological pump fixes carbon at the surface through the growth of phytoplankton. Um, and then animals help move this carbon down into the deep sea um, in both organic and inorganic, uh, the, it comes down both as um, organic matter and in inorganic carbonate form. And the animals that live on the deep sea floor <laughs> help to sequester and bury this carbon. And this biological pump is what allows us to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and it's been estimated that this ecosystem service of the deep sea, when one places a dollar value on it, is worth something like $125 billion a year. But there are other values of the deep sea as well. Um, some of them are harder to put a monetary, monetary number or value on. Um, the deep sea is very important for scientific research. All these exotic habitats and organisms provide great deal of interest to scientists. The deep sea provides um, play important areas for telecommunications where we lay all our cross oceanic cables. Um, the deep sea fuels both spiritual and aesthetic values, and I think Lily's artwork is a great example of the aesthetic values in deep water. And believe it or not, we're starting to have deep sea tourism. The Russian submersibles, m the mirror, now take people down to visit the Titanic on the bottom of the ocean. So this is a new field. But we can ask the question, is the deep sea pristine? Um, given the many values and the different ways that humans are starting to use this, I think you'll see the answer is, in fact, no, although the answer, the answer varies regionally. But the human footprint in the deep sea is growing rapidly. And I will be talking now about many of the incre increasing activities in the areas of fisheries, oil and gas extraction, and the potential for mining and bioprospecting. And then I'll talk about climate change as well as some of the different kinds of accidents and disposal that can happen there. And I'd like to start with fisheries. Over the past half century, shallow water fishes have become depleted. 
fished out, essentially, and fishing activities have moved into increasingly deeper waters. Um, there are now tens of thousands of tons of fish routinely recovered, shown in this diagram, from water depths of 500 to more than 1,000 meters. And this deepening of the fisheries has occurred for pelagic fishes, it has occurred for benthic seafloor fishes, it's occurred in the high seas, and most dramatically, it's occurred in the Antarctic fisheries, which have, are now fished on average 500 meters deeper than they were in the 1970s. What are some of the fishes that we take? I think many of these will look familiar to you. Some of them can be found in the grocery stores and restaurants, the orange ruffy, the Chilean sea bass, black cod, monkfish, rockfish, and we also have some deep sea invertebrate fisheries. There are king crabs and tanner crabs and deep sea shrimps that are routinely fished. There's big shrimp fisheries in the Mediterranean and off Brazil and a number of other countries. Most of the deep sea fish are very long lived and they grow very slowly. And this means that they also have very low reproductive rates and thus stocks are unlikely to recover once they're heavily fished. Thus most deep sea fisheries are, unlike, fisheries are unlikely to be sustainable. Much of the mortality of deep sea fishes um, from fishing actually often occurs as bycatch. That is, they are not the targeted fishery. Um, there have been intensive studies in the North Atlantic that have shown that of the top 15 species that are present there, um, nine of these have suffered major declines uh, to the point that many of them are endangered, and yet none of them are targeted fisheries. They're caught as incidental catch in the nets of fishermen out to collect other fish, and these have become critically endangered at depths between 500 and 1,500 meters. Um, you can see off the United Kingdom in this, this part of the North Atlantic. But fish are not the only groups of organisms that suffer um, from fishing trawls and nets as bycatch. Turns out sponges are, and, and corals also are easily collected, um, incidentally. Sponge bycatch in the Aleutian Islands, there's four times that of fish. And um, it's not just trawls. We've discovered that long lines, which people thought were a little bit safer, also damage up to one third of the, of, of the demo sponges there and 16% of glass sponges. These are two groups of sponges. So the damage is sufficient enough that Canada has actually gone ahead and protected their sponge reefs, but the U.S. has not quite gotten to that point yet. Um, damage from fishing also comes uh, from a process we call ghost fishing. This is when fishing nets are caught up on hard substrate and um, fall to the seafloor. Often they'll remain tangled up in gear and continue to catch fish, even though they've long since been abandoned by the fishermen. Um, but perhaps the most destructive of our deep water fishing practices is trawling. Trawls can literally decimate the bottom. Um, they thrash and trample the organisms and basically remove all the upright structures, le leaving what pretty much looks like a barren wasteland in their path. And so large areas of our continental slopes, in fact, have been trawled by deep sea fisheries. Many areas, um, seamounts and continental margins, start off looking like this with a lot of upright coral, a lot of three-dimensional structure and fish aggregations, and after the trawls have been through, this is pretty much what they look like, um, coral rubble. I think a good example of our potential to destroy habitats before we actually discover them in the deep sea comes from a study off New Zealand. I participated in an exploration cruise off the North Island of New Zealand in 2006, in which we found five new methane seep sites. These are the only seeps that have ever been discovered and observed off New Zealand, and every single one of them had evidence of uh, fishing damage. We either saw trawl marks that looked like this, or coral rubble, or a caught up fishing gear. And after that cruise, we went back and collected the fishing records. New Zealand keeps excellent records. And all of these little crosses here show trawls that have taken place along the coast. One of our new seep sites had been 
trawled over 200 times. And I think what's happening, um, because we've seen so little of the deep sea, is that we're beginning to damage it long before we discover the different habitats and organisms out there. OK, so that's what I'd like to say about fishing. Let me turn to oil and gas extraction. I mean, as many of you know, we are now um, extracting energy from deep water. And I'd like to just focus on the Gulf of Mexico for a minute, where we have on the order of 4,000 rigs out there. And you can see many of them are in deep water. This is the New Horizon rig. Um, and uh, that's probably familiar to almost everybody. It brings back images of memories that look like this, the blowout led to a lot of oil being put into deep water in the Gulf of Mexico. We haven't really heard very much about where that oil has gone and what the effects are. And I think the studies are just starting to come out. But there have been pictures like this of oiled corals um, down there near the blowout site. Now, the US is not the only country producing oil and gas in deep water. Um, Nigeria, Angola, and Brazil also have very active deep water production. And the New Horizon spill isn't the only spill. We know of, um, that there have been other deep water spills, but I bet many of you didn't know that there was a major oil spill about two weeks ago off Brazil um, at a Chevron site at 1,200 meters of water, already incurring over $193 million in damage. And I don't even know if that site's capped. And somehow it stayed out of the US press, but it's been in the international press. So we have, of course, the danger of deep water drilling and, uh, and blowouts. But there are other kinds of accidents. There are accidents that happen on the surface. Some of you may re remember the Petrobras rig falling and sinking into the deep sea, or perhaps the Prestige, which broke up and deposited a whole lot of oil into deep water. So we have all different kinds of accidents associated with both sh um, the shipping transport of oil and the drilling of deep water oil. Now, um, we don't often think about it, but many of the continental margins where we are drilling for oil and gas, and they're shown here in green, not so clear, but um, are also the places where we have our deep water fisheries, shown here in red. So there's a superposition of these two activities on the continental, many continental margins of the world. And um, these blue spots right here are places where methane hydrates are buried. I'll come back to this. Um, gas hydrates are a potential energy source which has not yet been tapped, but potentially could be um, once we figure out an economical and safe way to bring up that energy source. It's in fact a greater energy source than all the oil and gas reserves um, down in the ocean at this time. Another kind of extraction activity that hasn't actually occurred yet, but is ramping up in the deep sea, is minerals mining. This map shows you in blue um, all the high seas areas beyond um, national control. These are areas of international control. And their mineral resources are regulated by the International Seabed Authority. And the Seabed Authority has leased out large tracts of the deep sea floor. Um, for polymetallic nodule mining. These are what polymetallic nodules look like. They cover the Central Pacific. Um, and large tracks have gone out to China, Japan, Korea, France, and Germany. These nodules hold very large concentrations of copper, zinc, cobalt, nickel, and rare earth elements. Um, and just to give you some idea of the area that this covers, I have super, show it here superimposed on the United States. And you can see these leases extend for almost 3,000 miles. It's a huge area that um, once mining commences, and it hasn't yet because it hasn't been economically feasible, but once it does commence, this can involve vacuuming up vast quantities of seafloor. There's a new mining opportunity that's been discovered recently, and that is the fact the, the deep sea sediments actually contain fairly high concentrations of rare earth elements. We need increasingly larger uh, amounts of these for our electronics, for alternative energy sources, and for communications, things like cell phones. And so far, China has had a monopoly on these. And so um, this paper by some Japanese scientists has perked up um, worldwide interest in mining rare earths from deep sea sediments. Again, you can see from uh, much of the central and uh, 
Eastern Pacific. But what's really hot in deep sea mining right now is the potential to mine seafloor massive sulfides at hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents are areas where seawater circulates inside the Earth's crust and emerges at vents. Um, and as it emerges, as that hot water comes out into the cold, sea cold water at the seafloor, um, it precipitates massive sulfides with very high concentrations of copper, zinc, lead, gold, and silver. This map shows you the distribution of hydrothermal vents around the world in red. And the areas I've circled are places where um, hydrothermal vents have actually been leased for, the, for potential mining. Um, Papua New Guinea and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here. And in fact, not just Papua New Guinea, but all of the Solomon Islands and Tonga and Fiji, this whole region in the Southwest Pacific. Um, there are over 100 seafloor massive um, sulfide sites of interest to companies. And Nautilus Minerals, based in Canada, plans the very first active mining operation of hydrothermal vents off Papua New Guinea in 2013. This is a little schematic here of the operation. There will be a mining tool that will degrade, that will cut up the rocks, the vent rocks, and send them up to a surface ship where they'll be separated and some waste will come back down and some will be taken back to shore. Um, and this has become quite controversial, in fact. This hasn't started. There are meetings going on right now among the countries in that region to discuss environmental mining issues and um, how island nations are going to um, regulate their resources. But the mining of the Papua New Guinea vents raises many questions um, among scientists in particular. Um, hydrothermal vent habitats are patchy and vulnerable to disturbance, and we don't know very much about them. They're quite poorly studied in many parts of the world. We don't know how unique the animals are, so that when mining occurs at the Solwara One site in Papua New Guinea, we don't know, and these are pictures from that region, we don't know whether these animals will be able to colonize from other places, because we don't know anything about whether the animals there are endemic or whether they're in fact widespread. So we don't know patterns of connectivity among different vent sites and whether one, one unmined site can colonize um, a mine site. We don't know whether the vent sites provide um, trophic spillover, that is food for the surrounding communities. We don't know whether animals, um, one kind of animal facilitates another and whether to get good colonization you need to have all of the species present. There, there are many scientific questions um, remaining uh, before we can try, try to understand whether mined hydrothermal vents will actually be able to recover. Another potential um, emerging margin resource is one associated with coastal upwelling, and these are marine phosphates. This is a map of um, phosphate distribution in the ocean. The modern deposits are shown in red. These are upwelling areas where high production and low oxygen permits the precipitation of um, phosphate, and the fossil deposits are shown in the open circles. The phosphorus deposits are actually, um, uh, let me go back a minute and show you, the very first deep sea mining of phosphates is being proposed for off Namibia on the continental margin at about 220 meters. And the phosphate deposits there are linked to the activities of the world's biggest bacterial cells. These bacteria are called thiomargarita, or string of pearls. They're really very beautiful. And they sequester phosphorus and precipitate apatite, which is the mineral that has been proposed to be mined as a source of phosphorus. So Namibia has leased out major tracts of its seafloor um, for mining at, at these depths of around 200 meters, hundreds of thousands of hectares. Um, they're going to be using their diamond mining ships, which normally work in shallower water, but they're adapted and they can, um, in fact, mine these phosphorite deposits. And this will involve wholesale vacuuming of the seafloor. Three meters of the sea bottom will be vacuumed up when this mining occurs. Um, but what's so interesting is that well, and, and perhaps sad is that this leasing went ahead without cons consultation to the fisheries ministry in Namibia. And in fact, it's these same seafloor habitats covered by these same bacteria that precipitate the, the phosphates that actually provide um, 
the food for a very valuable um, fishery and important food web. So the bacteria and the worms that live in the bacteria are fed on by bearded gobies. And these fish, about yay big, swim up and down in the water column. They feed on the bottom, on the bacteria, then they swim up and they're fed on by hake, which are Namibia's largest fisheries. And those hake are, are fed on by horse mackerel, which are also an important fishery. And those feed the Cape fur seals and the very um, important bird populations off Namibia. So you can see that the mining that vacuum up, vacuums up the seafloor can have tr potentially great impacts on, their, uh, on the Namibian fishery. But that's not the only effect of the phosphate mining. They are proposing to bring that phosphate back to shore and to build an industrial plant with a phosphoric acid, mine, uh, phosphoric acid making plant um, because they need that acid to help process uranium. Namibia is having a uranium uh, rush. It's an important industry there. And so that phosphoric acid plant will in fact be spewing out all kinds of nasty chemicals in the air. And they want to build it right on the National Park, which is also a preserved lichen field. And lichens, for those of you who know about lichens, they're very sensitive to pollutants in the air. So there's an, this is sort of a potential follow-on effect of the phosphate mining that might happen in deep water affecting land. Other kinds of activities in the deep sea include waste disposal. Radioactive waste have been placed in the deep sea in the past. Here are some dump sites off, off uh, Europe. Also sewage has been placed in the deep sea in the past. The New Jersey dump site 106 right here off New Jersey is the biggest sewage disposal site. There was about eight years when that whole region put their sewage waste down into the deep sea. Um, we are disposing of mine tailings from terrestrial mining in the deep sea. That's going on in Papua New Guinea now. And it's also going on in Norway and a number of other countries. More or less unregulated. People believe that by putting things in the deep sea, they're getting them out of the way. And we also have a lot of disposal that goes on unintentionally in the deep sea. There's a lot of trash down there that's accumulated. You've all probably heard of the, the North Pacific garbage patch. Um, but some of that sinks to the bottom. And then we've had tsunamis that, uh, and you, uh, that transport massive amounts of debris out to the deep sea and down, down the continental slope into deep water. So there's a lot of garbage down there. Um, much of it we're responsible for. And then the last kind of um, human impact I'd like to talk about in the deep sea involves climate change. This is a much less direct effect, but as you'll see, it's an effect nonetheless. Uh, we have been, as probably most of you know, putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Some of that is entering the ocean, a considerable amount. And when it does, it reduces the pH of the ocean. And we call this process ocean acidification. And it is leading to a, a phenomenon, carbonate undersaturation. That means that the carbonate that makes the skeletons of things like deep water corals are actually um, it, are, are going to dissolve as the CO2 in the ocean increases. So corals are going to be in danger. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, carbonate undersaturation is also probably reducing the carbonate in the surface plankton, making them sink more slowly and affecting the production reaching the seafloor. The other kind of climate effect um, involves the greenhouse gas effect and warming of the planet. As the planet warms, the ocean warms. As the ocean warms, warmer water holds less oxygen. It also becomes stratified, and there's less vertical mixing. And so the ocean is, in fact, losing oxygen um, through global warming. And then there's also the potential that that warming is going to destabilize gas hydrate. So I'm going to talk about each of these just very briefly. Um, and let me start with the gas hydrates. I showed you that map before. There are gas hydrates buried on continental margins in deep water, 500 to 800 meters, all around the planet. And it's thought that just a warming of 3 degrees centigrade might be enough to destabilize some of that. Here you can see. Uh, you can see methane bubbling out here. This is the kind of thing that, that as, um, as, 
as the water warms, we might release more and more methane. Methane is 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So the potential feedbacks on um, ocean climate are there. I mentioned loss of oxygen. Uh, scientists have now started to measure changes in oxygen in the world's oceans. And over the last 40 years, it's become clear that the central regions of the deep oceans, from 200 to 700 meters, have increased their oxygen utilization and decreased the amount of dissolved oxygen concentration in this band of tropical and subtropical waters. And um, this has actually led to an expansion of naturally occurring low oxygen zones. And some of the consequences of this expansion will be crustacean die-offs. Crustaceans are very intolerant of low oxygen. And we also have a phenomenon called habitat compression. And as our low oxygen zones in midwater expand, species are getting pushed further up into better oxygenated waters. We're seeing this in the ground fish that occur in the Pacific Northwest, off California, Oregon, Washington, and Canada. And it's been estimated that by 2050, there are a whole host of fish species that are going to have going to have lost half of their available habitat by, due to loss of oxygen um, near the seabed. Now, at the same time, hypoxia or low oxygen tolerant species such as these giant squid, docidicus, and jellyfish are in fact expanding around the world. So we're changing our ecosystems as a result of this process which we call deoxygenation. It's sort of parallel to ocean acidification. Now, the acidification of the oceans I mentioned is going to have an effect on deep water corals because the waters are becoming undersaturated in carbonate. And this map shows the, the, um, the water depths at which cor deep water corals might be able to survive, at which aragonite saturation is greater than one. And, and basically, you can see that by the end of the century, it might be just a small band in the North Atlantic that's, in fact, suitable for deep water corals, whereas um, even we're going to lose large areas even um, over the next 10 to 15 years. And in fact, we have lost some deep water coral habitat as a result of ocean acidification. The other thing that warming and um, a lower pH ocean are doing is re potentially reducing the amount of primary production that's happening in surface waters and um, the reduction in production reaching the deep seabed. There are also some hypotheses that particles are going to sink slower because they don't have as much carbonate and that there's going to be decay in midwater creating oxygen holes in the environment. But those haven't actually been documented yet, but they've been hypothesized to potentially occur. But all of this tells us that we are going to be losing some of those key, key deep sea services that I've been telling you about. Low oxygen is going to reduce diversity. We're going to see loss of trophic support and habitat support as we lose deep water corals. And we're going to lose some of the ability of the deep water to sequester and bury carbon. So it's very clear with all these different kinds of things going on in the deep sea that there is a need for improved and coordinated stewardship of the deep ocean and its biodiversity. And I'd like to spend the remainder of the talk focusing a little bit on who's in charge of the deep sea and what can we do uh, about these issues. And I think that you, you'll see here from this rather busy slide that there are multiple jurisdictions in deep water. There are over 120, I'm not sure exactly how many countries have ocean coastline, but there are many. And um, they all have deep sea resources within their 200 mile limits. And each country regulates those independently, often with separate agencies for fisheries and for energy and for mining. And often those agencies don't talk very much to one another. Um, on the high seas or in international waters, we have biodiversity, mineral shipping, fisheries, all monitored and regulated. I shouldn't say monitored. They're all um, regulated by different agencies, different parts of the United Nations and different conventions and treaties. Um, and then there are a few things like scientific research, which are regulated only on a voluntary basis, and certain other activities that are more or less completely unregulated. 
So in order for, um, for us to actually take some action in conserving the resources and functions of the deep sea, we need to have both a national and an international focus on the importance of diversity as a resource for coming generations. I think we need to start by raising global awareness of the value of deep ocean biodiversity and the functions that it provides. I think we need to convert words to action by creating a political will to do something about this. And we need to build capacity in developing countries where many of these resources reside. And what I didn't mention is that the reason that the first mining is going to occur in countries like Papua New Guinea is because these are poor countries that don't have um, deep water policy exports or deep sea biologists, but they desperately need the money promised by the mining companies. And so um, I think capacity building has to build ocean literature ocean literacy around the world. We need to transfer technology to countries so they can find their uh, and protect their resources. And we need to create people power. In other words, to try to um, get the people invested and have having some say in their own resources. To do this, it's going to be necessary not just to do the science and to engage conservation scientists, but also to engage economists and sociologists policy experts and the stakeholders, the industries themselves, and the regulators in a multi-sectoral dialogue about sustainability. And this dialogue has to promote um, responsible resource development and application of BECS practices. And to do this, government agencies and the stakeholders have to work with scientists to um, apply some of these principles of sustainable development. This includes um, recognizing both the needs of both the present generation and the future generations. It involves a willingness to place a limit on use and exploitation of natural resources. It involves the equitable allocation of rights and obligations, and as I mentioned, the integration of these different disciplines, um, environment, social, economics, in sustainable development. I think we have to apply the precautionary approach in the deep sea, and this involves placing the burden of proof of no harm on the industries that want to develop the deep sea, not placing that burden of proof on the scientists, for example. I think we have to apply ecosystem-based management, which involves managing not on a species-by-species -species basis, but maintaining some of those habitats I've been talking to you about, the coral reefs and the methane seeps, the canyon habitats. Um, it involves marine spatial planning, and this means a willingness to create marine protected areas in deep water. And there are a whole series of other principles we need to do this with stakeholder participation. We have to, um, we have to um, make it clear that access to these resources carries responsibility to use the resources in a sustainable, efficient, and fair way. Decision making about the resources needs to be transparent, and there needs to be a tremendous amount of accountability. So these are big tasks. I mean, how do we do these things, and what are the tools available? Well, environmental impact statements, assessments, offer one kind of tool. There are a whole slew of sustainable fisheries management practices and tools. There are guidelines, codes of conduct, and best practices that are just now being written for some of these brand new industries. We also need to consider the potential for restoration and mitigation. Mining, for example, can accommodate these. And as I mentioned, we need to consider the use of marine protected areas in the deep sea. Now, this is a map, unfortunately, it's a little bit light, but it shows all the many, many marine um, UN World Heritage Sites. There are hundreds, but not a single one of them is in deep water. So I think it's time that the UN World Heritage Program begin to consider the deep sea. So I've less left you kind of with a, a a large agenda, but I did want to sort of take a step back and just say there are things that individuals can do. 
We can make informed choices at the grocery store and restaurants, knowing that deep sea species are probably not sustainable fisheries. And of course, the climate change issues can be addressed by trying to re reduce our CO2 emissions through our energy usage and gas consumption, and even the way we vote um, at the polling booth. But it's important that everybody who knows something now can share that knowledge and, and try to get involved in one way or another. And I'd like to leave you now with the idea that the deep sea is, as I've told you, we've seen very little of it. It's a nearly limitless source of undescribed diversity. These are charts of species descriptions over time, habitat descriptions, and several different groups. And um, every time we visit the deep sea, we discover something new. But I think it, it's fitting to leave you with this quote by Verlin Klinkenberg of the New York Times. It is not how many species we discover, it's how to protect them once we've found them and how to keep from destroying the species we do not know before we have a chance to find them. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. <laughs>
growing sections in the IPCC reports on the ocean. There is more modeling going on on the ocean. But when you go to Durban or Kyoto or all the places that have climate talks, the ocean doesn't have a very large role to the frustration of the oceanographers. Charlie, you might be able to answer that question better than I can. <laughs> the question was, um, can I provide more information about pr pr presumably the international leasing that's going on? Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Um, what I didn't mention is China and Russia just leased huge tracts of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge for hydrothermal vent mining, um, not even knowing exactly where the hydrothermal vents are, but just assuming that they're there and they're full of gold and silver and valuable minerals. And the International Seabed Authority controls these leases. They require a lot of um, environmental impact work, but I, I do not know um, what the dollar amounts are that are involved. And so I can't speak to whether you know, they're being leased fairly. Uh, I do know that only the countries signed on to the law of the sea have anything to say about it. And so you know, right now, we are, the US does some advising, the scientific experts, but we don't actually have any legal jurisdiction there. Uh, and I think the one of the reasons we haven't signed on to the law of the sea is that, we, that there is some verbiage about requiring um, technological sharing among all the countries of the world, and we haven't wanted to do that. I'm, I'm just guessing that that's one of the reasons. Um, and so, but I, you know, I would say that China is going to be the most aggressive leaser <laughs> of those deep sea minerals. Lisa, I want yeah. to thank you very much for a wonderful presentation.